Okay. We are given an integer integer n. Integer number is a tautology. Representing the number of functions running in a single threaded CPU. And an execution log. So we have a number n and an execution log. That is a list of strings. And each string has the format function ID, which is number, a number, separated by a column, separated by a string that's either start or end, separated by the colon and then a timestamp, indicating that the function with ID, with an ID, function ID, right, represented by that, either started or stopped execution at the time identified by the timestamp value. Each function has a unique, unique ID. Each function has a unique ID between 0 and n minus 1. Okay, that's what n is for. The first integer we get. Compute the exclusive time of the functions in the program. Note, the exclusive time is the sum of the ex execution times for all the calls to a specific function. Now, that is super confusing, but the examples make things clearer. And so imagine we got this list of strings. You can see how they are separated. So there's the function ID, followed by whether it's a start or end time, followed by the timestamp that this event occurred. So you can think of these as events, right, for the function call. And so in this case, we have function ID 0, starts at 0, then function ID 1. Down here, you can see it, it coming to life down here. Uh, function ID 1, the starts at timestamp 2, as you can see here, timestamp 2, and ends at timestamp 3. And then 2 starts at 4, ends at 7, and then 0 finally ends at 8. And since it's, since it's single-threaded, only one function can run at a time. Okay? Since it's single-threaded. Single and... We have some other examples of inputs, and this is the type of output we're expecting. So if you pay attention here and look at this, is the, the, in, the zeroth index represents the function ID 0, the oneth index function ID 1, right? And, the, and so on, right? The nth index represents function ID n, and so forth, so on and so forth. So let's look at what the answer looks like. Um, now I think... Um, there's this whole explanation here, right? From one, one through six. Uh, we're going to use a stack. You know, if you're following the series, right? We're taking a pattern-based approach, approach to these problems. And we're currently evaluating a stack pattern, like solutions that are solved with stacks. And just like with in real life, right? A single threaded CPU uses a stack to manage function execution, preemption, and resumption. The preemption is like following and resumption we can use a stack to perform our calculation. And I'm just going to get straight into how this works with this example. Okay, and you and move back and forth between this example, this diagram and the code. And so we have a result array, right, that we are going to initialize to n, right, the n we get. And what does that look like? So I have this function exclusive time that does the computation. This is the result array that we're trying to build. And this is where we're initializing it uh, with n, right, the size n, filling it with zeros just like in the diagram. And then we have the stack, uh, I would call ours log stack. And it's, if you're familiar with TypeScript, it's gonna hold, uh, I was gonna say, it's gonna hold uh, the, this object that we've created, right? This uh, instances of this, of this class that we've created. And so I've got, taken the liberty to type some of these things. Uh, if, so this, it makes it like easier to understand in some way. So this is using TypeScript's uh, templates string feature. So we own a number, either start or end, and a number, right? So the function ID and the timestamp. And those, that's what those numbers represent. And then we take this log that takes in this log entry, right? It takes strings of this form. And what it does is it creates an object with these properties in, the, in them. The ID, which is the function ID, whether it's a start or not, and the timestamp, right? So by parsing that string, splitting as far, it's by splitting and parsing that string. And now we go back we have these things initialized, right? Which is the current state of things over here. And what we want to do is um, check each loop through everything here, every single content here, which is what's happening here, right? We're looping through all the logs, as you can see. And then for each log, we're going to create a new one and then check if it's a start time. If it's a start time, we're going to put it into the stack. 
So if it's a start time and this is a start, we're going to put it into the stack like so. So that's what's on top right now. And then we're done with that loop, that instance of that loop, right? And then we go again. And then we see another start. Every time we see a start, we just put it onto the stack. So we do that again. Oh, and now we see an end. And now that's an opportunity to pop something from the stack. And so we pop the stack and compute the specified function's execute time, execution time. So this matches this, right? What's on top? So we're going to use that to take this out. And that's what this looks like in code. So you pay attention to this else branch. So we're going to take it out, the top, what's on top. And in this case, that's what this is, right? This second thing, that's what's on top. And what are we going to do with it? We are going to add the execution time of the current function in the actual result. So we're going to update our result for the first time. And how are we going to do that? We're going to take the current thing we're evaluating, the current log we're evaluating, the time, subtract it from what's on top, add one, right? So we avoid off by one errors. And that's something important worth no noting. The minimum, once something has a start time, the minimum unit of time it can have is one, right? That's why we have that one in this computation here pardon me and so uh, i think the diagram shows it well so it shows the calculation so in this case the execution time is going to be three right this uh timestamp here minus the timestamp that was there before plus one right, which gives us two and because it's id one we're going to update results over here to that value that we just calculated that's two and not only that we're also go because the stack isn't empty we're going to take what's on top the id for what's on top and subtract to subtract whatever we came out the execution time that we just came up with right so that's what this does and it's a bit it's a bit convoluted like in hindsight i can probably extract this into a variable because it appears here and uh here as well but um i think it's not too bad okay so the, this is when they add it to the results right they index it with the id the function id you remember that came from the stack and so and that's because it's not it's a start right you know this is the only case that we evaluate when it's not a start time when it's an end time and then we also check if there's anything in the stack right um we're going to subtract the current child function execution time from the parent function and that's what we're doing here we're indexing uh, what's in the stack, what's on top of the stack right now, right, by the ID, the function ID, and we're taking out the execution time that we just computed for the thing we just popped from the stack. And you go through that, through the whole length of the array, yeah, you're done, you return the result, safe any, that's all there is to it. And now, your solution in an interview probably almost definitely wouldn't be this elegant unless you've seen it before, but uh, you've seen it before, so go and win, all right, go and win. So the strings contain start, so you push the function ID to the, to the stack. Anytime you start, you push, push it to the stack. Then end, so then you compute the execution time. When you pop it off, you get four. You're gonna, it's two, so zero, one, two. This is gonna be updated to four. And then zero is what's in here. So it's gonna be decremented by four as well. Zero is gonna be decremented by four, as you can see. And then lastly, we come and run in contact with this. And we don't have to do any scrub validation here, right? We're assuming that the data is, and you want to mention that, that you're assuming that the data is clean when uh, it comes in. And so at the end, you pop from the stack, we pop the last thing off the stack. Uh, we get nine, we update our results. So six minus six plus nine is going to be three, as you can see. And then we're done. We've looped through the entire array, nothing else to do. Safe feeding. Now let's look at the time complexity. Okay, now there's a funky time complexity. Okay, so let's say there are m events in total, right? And each log line contains either start or end, which is always a constant number of characters. The line also has a function ID and a start or end time. Since we're processing the string a single character at a time, we need to know how many digits the function ID has. It has log of log to base n of ten because we use we count in base ten and digits and then there is a starter end time which has log to the base of 10 of t digits where t is the time at which the last event occurs a particular event log entry takes this time right because you add the two of them and plus t therefore the overall time running time is uh m times log to the base 10 of this or simply o of m log n plus t that is so complicated that is so complicated um i'm gonna just wrap it wrap it in an interesting way um, hmm. space complexity is O of M because if 
M events in total. Uh, so in the worst case, you're going to store, the stack is going to be filled in M times. Um, but it's uh, convoluted type of complexity. Yeah, you probably want to just commit to memory, to be honest. Uh, uh, but it does make sense. So, yeah. See you next time. Like, comment, subscribe, upvote. Thank you so much. Cheers.